Watch Underscore Dogs, or just Watch Dogs, is one of those games I haven't really thought about since I first played it way back in 2014. I got it on day one, went through almost all the entire game, and that was it. I just moved on. While I wasn't exactly blown away, I remember enjoying it well enough. The game just didn't leave much of an impact on me after I finished it. I think my indifference to the first game is what ultimately kept me from trying out its sequels, even when Watch Dogs 2 was hyped as being much better than the first. Though, ever since Legion's release, I've noticed a lot more fans looking back at the first game fondly. Is that because of the quality of the sequels, or did the game have more going for it than people gave it credit for? Well, let's find out. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Opera GX. The internet browser made for gamers, by gamers. Opera GX provides you with everything you need for general internet browsing. With the bonus of being able to control what your browser does and looks like, video editing is a very memory intensive process, which usually means if I want to speed up the rendering process, I need to close out my other programs, internet browser included. But with Opera GX, I can limit the amount of RAM and CPU it uses, so I can keep it open and still browse the net while I wait for a video to render. You can even keep any of your messaging apps on the sidebar, making it easy to switch to them while you're still browsing the net. And their mods feature lets you customize every aspect of the Opera GX browser, like the wallpaper, background music, and sounds when typing and switching tabs. They have a huge assortment of options to choose from in the mod shop, even with a bunch of GTA themed ones. And you know I just had to install the San Andreas mod. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. So if you're looking for a more fun and personalized browser experience, use my link down below to download Opera GX today. At the beginning of Watch Dogs, we find our protagonist, Aiden Pierce, having trekked down a man by the name of Maurice. Eleven months ago, Aiden and his mentor Damien were pulling a heist job at a fancy hotel called the Merlot. The job goes south after another unknown hacker enters the system and ends up triggering the security and exposing the pair. Damien insists they stick to the plan and wait till he gets his hands on the information they wanted, stumbling on a strange encrypted video before Aiden finally bails. Despite their attempts at staying off the grid, their signals were tracked down and their identities were exposed, with a hitman sent after Aiden. Said hitman was Maurice, who attacked Aiden as he was out with his niece Lena, blowing out the tires to his car, leading to a crash that would result in the death of the little girl. Racked with anger and guilt over Lena's death, Aiden has spent the last 11 months trying to find Maurice, and whoever was responsible for putting a hit on him in the first place. Despite working the guy over pretty good, Maurice doesn't have a name, insisting that whoever hired him is much more powerful and threatening than Aiden. Frustrated, he'll knock out the terrified hitman before hacking his phone and listening to an audio file on it. He doesn't have any info that could shed a light on who wanted Aiden dead, but we do learn he's been relentless since the botched hit job, as Maurice has been on the run terrified of Aiden's wrath and desperate to stay one step ahead of him, going as far to pay a gang to protect and hide him. Not that it did him any good. There's a few things I want to say about both characters, but I'll have to save it for a little later, as we got a tutorial section to get through first. Yo, Maurice! Yo, it's shaking, motherfucker! Shit! Where the hell you been? What? He's talking to me. Ah! 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 I leave you for two minutes. Give me my bullets. I tossed them. This lovely fellow who looks like the Fortnite Battle Pass knockoff of the Dragon of Dojima is a fixer by the name of Jordy Chin. Been, eh? 
Mildly annoying at times, but a chill guy with a good sense of humor. He works as a good foil to the stoic, silent, and borderline plank of wood that is Aiden Pierce. Though where Aiden has a moral compass, or pretends he does anyhow, Jordy is completely amoral. Focused on getting paid first and foremost, when it comes to getting work done, he has zero issues with civilians getting caught in the crossfire. Despite their working relationship and good rapport with each other, they don't consider each other friends. That said, Jordy will be a constant presence throughout the game, assisting Aiden from both behind the scenes and out on the field. I vaguely remember not liking him the first time I played Watch Dogs. I don't know why, but I think my issue was that he almost felt too out of place in what was supposed to be a more serious story. This recent playthrough had me do a 180 on my opinion of him though, as I really came to enjoy his more relaxed and extroverted personality, feeling like a much needed breath of fresh air to some of the more serious moments, or Aiden's brooding. After Jordy stages the scene to make it look like a gang shootout, and then calls the police to further cover their tracks, he'll kidnap Maurice while Aiden is left to sneak out of the stadium. While Watch Dogs is a third person shooter in a similar vein to Grand Theft Auto, there's a heavy focus on stealth gameplay and outside of a couple exceptions, the majority of the game can be played through without killing anyone or firing a single bullet. You have your basic crouch and sneak mechanic where Aiden can hide behind an object before waiting for an enemy to turn around or walk away in order to sneak past them. The game makes use of an alert meter for enemy NPCs, letting you know if you're in their line of sight and that will fill up the longer you're partially visible to them before you're completely exposed and they start blasting Aiden. Since sitting around waiting for enemies to move can get boring fast, you do have more options to move things along and make things easier for yourself. For one, you can just straight up knock an enemy out if you approach them from behind while they're unaware. The more versatile option though is making use of your smartphone to hack things around you. First, you can hack into a camera and use it to observe your surroundings to see how many enemies you need to deal with, and bounce between multiple cameras provided they're in view and range. Next, you can create distractions by turning on machinery, opening shutters, creating noise by turning on a car's alarm, broadcasting sounds from a phone or radio, and much more. Or you can use a little more force and take out enemies by overloading electrical panels till they explode, or causing steam pipes to burst to incapacitate them just long enough for you to rush in and knock them out. You're not limited to using objects in the environment either, as there's a variety of items you can craft to assist in combat. Super random, but have you ever noticed that a floppy disk is universally used as a symbol when saving data on your computer or in a game? But due to it being obsolete and no longer in use, younger kids might not even recognize what the symbol is meant to depict. So I kind of had a moment like that myself during this opening section of Watch Dogs, as when the crafting tutorial started up and the game told me to open up the weapon wheel, it told me to press this key. And I was like, what? Is that shift? Or enter? Or do I press the left and right directional keys at the same time or something? So I search all over my keyboard, press random buttons, but nada. I google it, and it's tab. It's the tab key. Those two arrows are meant to represent indentations like what the tab key is used for. Older keyboards, and possibly some current models, I have no idea, my own keyboard sure doesn't have it, would label the tab key with both the word tab and the arrows. So yeah, a bit of an embarrassing brain fart on my part. But can you really blame me for not knowing that right away? As Watch Dogs is probably the first game I've ever experienced that refers to it by the arrows and not outright saying tab. Admittedly, I was a bit stubborn at first, as I refused to Google it, and so I just remapped the key and the settings to I, since it's supposed to pull up your inventory. And I is the go-to button for inventory in like 99% of games. But when that got really annoying and awkward to press, especially in the middle of shootouts, I bound it back to tab when I found out what the key was, and a couple of hours in I ended up just switching to using a controller. As the camera and mouse sensitivity felt wonky and made certain actions like driving feel off. Not sure if it's me or a game thing as I couldn't get it feeling right after playing with the settings, but the second I switched to a controller, it felt natural, like I was playing GTA 5 again. Alrighty, let's get back to the crafting mechanic. Making use of electronic parts and other objects you can pick up in a level or buy from a store. Aiden can MacGyver some gadgets to help him with encounters. You can create a lure to throw and stick onto something, hacking it to make noise and work as a makeshift distraction when there's nothing else in the room to use. CTOS scan, which instantly marks enemies around you, as opposed to having to profile them yourself or making use of cameras to scan them. 
Next tool is Jam Communications, which can turn off police scanners and prevent enemies from calling backup. Blackout, which will straight up knock out the power in a given area, allowing you to hide in the darkness to sneak around enemies at the cost of being unable to hack anything till the power returns or you're out of range of its effect. Your tools aren't all about stealth though, as you can craft some offensive options to help you out in fights too. Like a frag grenade you can toss and will explode after a few seconds, an IED that basically works as a mine, as you can remotely explode it once it's set, and finally the proximity IED which will just blow up on its own when an enemy is close enough. You're limited in your options at first as most of the craftables aren't unlocked until you're further in the game, but it gives you a variety of options in combat outside of just going guns blazing. And this is probably the most enjoyable aspect of the game, as it got to be more strategic when approaching encounters, I had fun experimenting with the different tools and hacks, and I really challenged myself to get into shootouts as a last resort. It keeps encounters from feeling repetitive and just trading shots with enemies until you can kill them. While not as in-depth or sophisticated, it reminds me a lot of how Hitman would push and reward the player for being stealthy, or exploring the environment for interesting ways to kill a target. Man, I really want to go play Hitman Blood Money now. There's more aspects to the hacking mechanic, but I'll circle back to that in a bit. After Aiden makes it to the stadium above, Jordy's stupid plan of calling the cops bites him in the ass, as the place is completely locked down now and he has no way of getting out of there. Needing some assistance, he calls up his hacker friend, The Legend 27. Is it The Legend 27? Yeah, The Legend 27. Who is The Legend 27? Sorry, I mean Bad Boy 17, who Aiden asked to help him find an access point to the stadium systems. His plan? To cut the power and create a blackout so he can sneak out. Sounds rather reckless and extremely dangerous. Who knows what kind of panic could ensue with so many people here at the stadium. But we gotta finish that tutorial level. Once the lights go out, we'll finally slip out of the stadium and hop into our getaway car to escape the police search perimeter. I don't have much to say about the driving in this game. For the most part, it handles like GTA 5. Cars do accelerate faster, so I do have to be careful about slowing down when taking turns or else I'll overshoot them. But otherwise, I think it's pretty good. I have no issues with it. Also, like in Saints Row, any cars you buy or steal can instantly be spawned by using your phone and having it delivered near your location, eliminating the hassle of having to use a garage or to manually store them, or the frustration of destroying a really nice car you got your hands on. Now when it comes to the police AI and their tactics when it comes to chasing you down, I think it works perfectly. So if you saw my GTA 5 video, you'll recall I wasn't a big fan of its wanted system or police response as regardless of what your wanted level was, it always felt like it'd take forever to finally lose their attention. They could zero in on your position even if you hid while completely out of their field of vision, would spawn in around you in the most remote of areas, and at higher levels had such precision with their shooting it felt like they were using aimbots, basically making most encounters with the cops an annoying hassle. Here they're way more balanced, offering a challenge that doesn't make them too overwhelming or too easy and brain dead. First, committing a crime won't instantly put them on your ass, as when a civilian spots you doing something illegal, like killing someone or carjacking them, you'll see them try to report Aiden to the police. If you jam their communications, scare them by threatening to shoot them, outright shoot and kill them, or non-lethally take them down to take their phone, you could prevent the police from showing up altogether. Failing to avoid their attention, Chicago's finest will start to scan the area in search of Aiden, represented by these glowing yellow circles on your minimap. While in those circles, a percentage counter will start to tick off with the boys in blue locking into your location if it hits 100%. Depending on what you did that got the police's attention will determine how high your heat level is and the intensity of the police response. With more police officers, helicopters, blockades, or SWAT being dispatched depending on your wanda level. Similar to GTA 5, you can only lose the cops and lose your heat level by staying out of their field of view or ducking and hiding in your car but you have much better options to ditch them. Circling back to the hacking mechanic, you can use it while driving too. Hacking traffic lights, raising blockers, bridges, spikes, or bursting steam pipes in order to disable the squad cars after you. Conveniently, since it can be tough to judge the distance the cop car is from you, you'll get a prompt on screen for the perfect moment to hit the hack button and guarantee you take out their car. And you can also unlock the option to disable helicopters temporarily. To keep you from trivializing police chases though, the higher tier driving hacks have to be unlocked later in the game, 
and you deplete your phone's battery for every hack you choose. So you can't endlessly spam it and will have to wait for it to recharge if you empty the battery. Clear out all the boys in blue chasing after you, and they'll switch to search mode. Creating a perimeter around your last lone location, marked by a white circle on the minimap. Avoid their attention for 30 seconds or escape the search perimeter, and they'll finally give up and your heat level will be cleared. It may sound like a lot of steps and things to deal with, but it all gels so well and makes police chases actually exciting, instead of a frustrating burden like in GTA V. Outside of a few encounters later in the game, they don't feel overwhelming or unstoppable either, so every chase feels fair. If I had to level some criticism at the police chases, depending on where you are on the map, it could be tough to hack a helicopter due to the camera's positioning. And sometimes when trying to disable a cop car by hacking something, you may end up caught in the crossfire if the prompt to hack snaps to a hazard in front of you as opposed to behind you, though moments like that were rare throughout my playthrough. After giving the cops the slip, Aiden will head back to his base of operations, some dinky motel room. As demonstrated by his Charlie Kelly wall of crazy and him spying on his family, Aiden's vendetta has completely consumed his life, to the point of alienating his still-living family, his sister Nikki and nephew Jackson, which at first you may think is Aiden's way of keeping them safe after what happened to Lena, but as the game goes on, we'll learn that's not really the case. But I'll get to his relationship with his family in just a bit. First, it's time to talk about the game's skill and progression system. As you complete story missions and side content, you'll earn skill points after earning enough experience and leveling up. You can then invest those skill points into upgrades for driving, hacking, combat, and crafted items. Investing in the driving tree will let you do things like instantly disabling a car's alarm when you steal it, or reducing the damage you take during car collisions. The hacking tree will unlock all those higher tiered hacking options I discussed before, along with things like increasing the money you can steal from people or increase your phone's battery life. The combat tree can reduce the recoil of your guns, increase the damage certain guns do, reduce the damage you take from bullets and explosions, along with unlocking the focus mechanic. When activating your focus, you'll slow down time, either using that time to find things to hack around you or just make shootouts easier by lining up headshots. And you can also use it while driving to navigate through traffic or make turns easier. So focus is basically Michael and Franklin's abilities from GTA 5 combined, though slightly more broken as it can be refilled faster with the right upgrades. You can craft Adderall to instantly use it, or hit up a coffee shop for the sweet caffeine fix. Though it's not really a get out of jail free card, as if you have too many enemies alerted to your position, it isn't going to save you from being shot to pieces. Also, I'm not sure if it's as handy for driving as it is for Franklin, mostly because I forgot it was usable in a car and pretty much never used it during my playthrough. Overall, I like the skill system in Watch Dogs. It doesn't feel tacked on, upgrades actually feel like upgrades instead of offering something useless like 5% poison resistance or something, and the stronger perks are locked until you progress far enough in the story or complete certain side content, which incentivizes you to actually go out and do that side content, which while their quality varies, at least you have a reason to do most of them. After Aiden goes to bed and the game flashes back to the day Lena died for like the third time in the last 30 minutes, it's time for another tutorial, this time stopping potential crimes. Profiling the people around you by scanning their phones and learning info about them, you might stumble upon a potential crime about to happen, which the game will mark on your map to run over to. Head into the blue circle, do some more scanning, and narrow down the potential criminal and their victim. Since Aiden isn't psychic, you have to watch them and wait for the criminal to almost do something to their victim, and then run after them to pull off a citizen's arrest. Successfully take down the perp and keep the victim unharmed, you'll get a boost to Aiden's reputation which affects how the general public see him and react to his antics. A negative rep means they're more likely to report him to the police when seeing him commit a crime, while a positive one means they're less likely to report his behavior and will outright support his vigilanteism. And I'll be honest, I just don't care about this side activity at all. It pops up too often, feels way too annoying to stop what you're doing to interrupt a crime, and your reputation naturally increases plenty throughout the story, so it doesn't really feel worth doing at all. Feels like something they tossed in to pad out the game or try to soften Aiden's image and frame him as this do-gooding vigilante who has to work outside the law to stop criminals when the cops can't or won't. Kinda like Batman. Shit, he even has his own vigilante nickname. 
the fox, which I'm only just now realizing is what the symbol on his hat is supposed to be. The Batman comparison becomes way more on the nose by the end of the game, but we'll cross that road when we get there. For now, let's start moving the story along and get Aiden to his nephew's birthday party. Ten. No, I think you're nine. Ten. Nine. Ten. Nine. <laughs> ten. Well, in that case, uh, you deserve ten birthday tickles. What? One, two, three, four, Whoa. five, six, Whoa. seven, Whoa. eight, nine, ten. <laughs> ten. 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 Stay here for a second. So, an entire year and... and yeah, late. Yeah, I'm sorry, Nate. Really. Wait, Aiden, you didn't bring your nephew a present? Like, being late is one thing, but you couldn't use your super hacker skills to find out what Jackson, still traumatized by the death of his sister, by the way, wants for his birthday? Couldn't even drop by a pharmacy for a cheap toy? Deadbeat dads put more effort than you do, Aiden. Which nicely brings me to his dynamic with his family. Which, if the game didn't explicitly tell you Nikki was his sister and Jackson her son, you'd be forgiven for mistaking him as the father and husband in the family. I'm not insinuating there's something more romantic in his relationship with his sister. No, 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 no. But the whole scenario of being distant from the family, to how Jackson looks up to him and is eager to see him, to the trope of showing up to his birthday late like he forgot, are things you'd expect from a divorced dad. I think it's mainly because Nikki's husband is nowhere to be seen, and the game doesn't really bring up what happened to him. So with Aiden being the only male figure in hers and Jackson's lives, my brain just auto-slots him into the role of dad. While his family are happy to see him, they're still dealing with Lena's death almost a year since it happened. Jackson has become withdrawn, barely speaking to anyone outside of his mother, now visiting a therapist by the name of Yolanda who is trying to help him open up again. Nikki, while happy to see her brother and thanking him for showing up, as it'll do a lot in helping her son, is reluctant to let Aiden back into their lives unless he's willing to change, and to stop his obsession with finding the person responsible for Lena's death. Which, after initially lying to his sister that he has changed, Aiden ends up immediately outing himself a few moments later when he finds out someone has been calling and harassing his sister. Despite his concern for her safety and his ability to track down the bozo making the calls, Nikki refuses his help. Blowing up on him that his attempts to fix their lives and protect them only makes things worse. Which, future events of the game will end up proving her right. But let's finally get around to discussing the character of Aiden Pierce. On a surface level, the game portrays him as a sympathetic man racked with guilt and with good motivations for seeking revenge. But if you stop to think about his actions, his justifications for them, and the consequences for the things he does, you realize that Aiden is kind of a selfish hypocrite. Even though his sister and nephew never pin Lena's death on him, and practically beg him to forgive himself so he can move on, he can't. She was caught in the crossfire because Maurice was sent after Aiden. Which, yeah, understandable why he'd feel that way. His actions as a fixer ended up leading to her death. After months of chasing Maurice, he finally tracked him down and had him at his mercy. But that wasn't enough. He needed to know who hired him. His obsession feels less like avenging his niece, but more so a justification for finding out who wanted him dead in the first place and why. I say that mainly because he still has Nikki and Jackson. They're both alive and have been suffering since Lena died. More so than Aiden. They effectively lost two family members that day. Forced to grieve on their own as he kept his distance from them that he justifies as protecting them. Problem is that by leaving them alone, they have a much harder time dealing with their grief. So much so that Jackson has closed himself off and can't communicate with other people. This is what Nikki meant when she said he ends up making things worse by trying to fix them. By trying to get justice for Lena, and trying to protect his family by staying away from them, he ultimately makes them suffer more. Not only that, but his little vendetta is directly putting his family in danger. As after going against Nikki's wishes, he'll track the number of the person who's been calling her, and harassing her, to find out the guy was being paid off by a separate party to do it, in order to go after Aiden and flush him out. Which, instead of realizing his actions are now putting his remaining family in danger, 
he sees it as a justification for continuing his crusade. I don't want to get into events that happen later in the story, but every time something happens as a direct result of Aiden's actions, he never stops to accept responsibility for them or just shifts the blame. Other people certainly will blame him and tell him he just needs to stop, but he never does. You might think we're going with a flawed protagonist who loses everything in their quest for revenge kind of story, but that's not exactly the direction the game takes. Also, ignoring things the player can make him do, Eden isn't really the virtuous hacker who's better than the criminal ones. For one, the main way he'll be making cash throughout the game is by hacking the phones of random citizens around Chicago. Despite acting like he has a moral compass, he'll still take on illegal fixer contracts that have him stealing cars, taking out criminals, or acting as a driver for other criminals. You can argue back and forth about whether it's intentional or not by the game's writers. Did they mean to write him as self-serving and hypocritical? Did they fumble the ball in their attempts of trying to make him this badass hacker guy, accidentally gleaming over his more negative traits? Or is he a deeply troubled man who needs to play hero as he can't deal with the reality of who he is and what his actions have done to others? I'll leave that question up in the air for now, but I'll bring it up again much later when we hit certain big story moments. Returning to the plot, after taking down the guy who was calling Nikki and hacking his phone, Aiden will call up Bad Boy 17 to help trace its location. They can't pinpoint it exactly, only narrowing it down to a district in Chicago known as the Loop. Needing access to the city's security system, Aiden will head to the CTOS control center in order to hack it and let him pinpoint the call. CTOS, or the Central Operating System, is the digital information system that's meant to manage the infrastructure of all of Chicago. This means everything from traffic lights to security cameras to people's phones and just about every electronic device are all connected to this network. It's the everything is online future predicted by Mega Man Battle Network. And like every piece of cyberpunk fiction ever written. This system was created and run by the Bloom Corporation. Your run of the mill evil tech giant who uses this system to gather info on all of Chicago's citizens along with invading the privacy of their everyday lives. I'll talk about Bloom later when they're more active in the plot. For now, it's time for another tutorial, and discussing all the things you can discover on the map. Now, when you're driving around as Aiden, when entering a new district for the first time, you won't have access to the large system to hack things until you hit up the area CTOS control center. These centers are heavily guarded, requiring you to first find a guard who has access to codes to the system, before finding the access point needed to give Aiden a backdoor into the CTOS. You're free to take whatever approach you want to getting the job done, either sneaking in and avoiding the guards, just gunning everyone down, or you can use the camera system to find what you need and hack the place, all without taking a single step inside. And honestly, I love these levels. Like I brought up earlier, there's just something so satisfying about completing an objective without being spotted or firing a bullet. Once you crack the access point, you'll play a little hacking minigame where you need to move and turn different nodes in order to complete the blue data stream until you can finally unlock the system. It's super basic, and you'll be seeing it a lot throughout the game, with different levels of hacking and occasionally being put on a timer before you're kicked out of the system, but I think it's okay. I remember it was getting a lot of criticism at release because of how simple it was, but would you really want a more realistic hacking scenario? where you need to gather tons of code to try and brute force an encryption, or use a third-party program to do it while you just sit around waiting for it to complete. Like, yeah, there are probably more interesting ways to do it, like how Cyberpunk 2077 does it, for example, but I feel like keeping it simple stops it from slowing down the gameplay, especially as there will be plenty of times when you need to break into an access point while in the middle of combat. Once you do get in the system, the map will then mark all the CTOS towers that are in the local area. While effectively working as the usual Ubisoft tower like you've seen in Far Cry and Assassin's Creed, that will unlock points of interest and side missions on the map, I actually really like going for CTOS towers, mainly because they avoid the usual repetition associated with them, as each one involves some verticality, parkour, and hacking things around you in order to reach them. Quite a few even need you to think outside the box too. For example, one of them needed me to get in a car, move a shipping container up to the roof, and then drive through a fence to reach the tower. There aren't too many of them, and it never takes too long to unlock them either. So, it never feels tedious to stop and head for a tower in between missions. Now, a lot of things will be marked off on the map when accessing a tower, 
So I'm just going to speed through them. First is new hideouts for Aiden, where he can change his clothes, sleep to change the time of day, and listen to any audio logs he finds during the game. They also serve as fast travel points, so you can instantly warp to them when choosing them on the map, assuming you're not in a story mission or in combat. Next are access points you can hack into to spy on people in their homes, watching them as they work out, talk to family, or in one instance, watch a guy as he tries to look for porn. And sometimes you'll spot another device in the room you can hack for crafting material or cash. There's city hotspots that mark famous locations around Chicago, CTOS Breach, which are time trials where you have to hack a few CTOS boxes before the time runs out, which unlocks a set of audio logs pertaining to an employee at Bloom, big QR codes painted on buildings that can only be scanned by standing in the right spot to complete it, and that will unlock a bonus mission when you scan all of them, a bunch of mini games where you can play chess, poker, go drinking, or playing AR games that have you collecting coins or shooting aliens, digital trips that let you play a different set of mini games, like Madness, which involves driving a car through an apocalyptic hellscape, running over demons and collecting souls. Psychedelic, which has Aiden on an actual drug trip, bouncing around on flowers. Though the controls for it are awful and super floaty. It is funny to hear him sound happy and goofy though. Then there's Spider Tank, the best digital trip, where you just tear up the city and destroy everyone using a spider mech. Alone, where you gotta avoid these camera head robots to turn on generators. And finally, Conspiracy, where you have to expose and take down alien cyborgs. And there's still so, so much more. But to get things moving along, I'll bring up that side content when it's introduced or unlocked during the story. So yeah, Watch Dogs isn't exactly lacking in the side content department, though it does feel like there's a little too much. And despite what I said about how the game incentivizes you to do them in order to unlock certain skill perks, they can still feel tedious and some only unlock guns or cars. Also, I'll be honest, I did end up skipping a few of them like QR codes and CTOS breach, as I just didn't have the patience for them. Now that Aiden has access to the loop CTOS system, Bad Boy 17 can start looking for the person who ordered that random guy to harass Nikki. In the meantime, we need to do a favor for Jordy, as a client of his needs a wheelman to assist with a delivery job. this? What the hell, a fixer? I made too much noise in the loop. This guy's found me. Well, now I better find him. Jordy's job will have to wait. Heading to the mission location, you'll be locked out of it and thrown into a tutorial for the game's invasion mechanic instead. You're being hacked by another fixer and need to use your phone's profiler to narrow down his location and stop him before he steals your data. This is the game's online and multiplayer component, where other players can hop into your game and do the same thing with the winner of the hacking duel gaining a bump to their notoriety. As you increase your notoriety, you unlock exclusive skills that you can use during these invasion encounters. Though if your notoriety goes down enough, you'll lose access to those skills. While I didn't really play with it much during this recent playthrough, I did really dig the idea back in the day when the game first launched. Felt like a fun way to shake up the usual gameplay, or just mess with someone else who was playing the game when I was bored. Though you can turn off the feature completely if you don't want to be bothered while you're playing. Now that we can go back to the mission, Aiden will first have to avoid police scans on his way to the fixer he's been hired to help. Scooping the guy up, he'll then have to avoid the cops and escape the search area before taking the fixer to the drop-off point. Unfortunately, the guy's client was less than impressed by his performance. Get a chance to talk to your mama? All your friends? Your girl? No, sir. I was in a hurry. That's good. Very good. The Crypt Keeper here is Lucky Quinn leader of the Chicago South Club, an Irish-American criminal syndicate that controls most of the city's criminal underworld. It's a little weird he would show up in person to pick up the laptop from some nobody fixer, instead of just having his goon do it, but we gotta have an establishing character moment for the guy, so we know he's bad news and not someone to fuck with. Aiden is smart enough to understand that, 
and avoids any confrontation by just going on his way. Despite how much he'd like to send that living mummy off to hell, Aiden understands messing with Lucky and the club would blow up on him hard and put his family in danger. Again, Bad Boy 17 will call up later claiming to have some important info, asking to meet up with Aiden face to face. With a screen name that's so bland and generic that you'd see a few variations of it when hopping into a lobby of the original Modern Warfare 2, we're probably about to meet up with some neckbeard who steals his neighbor's Wi-Fi to do all their hacking or something. Bad Boy 17? Clara. Clara. God damn. Looks like our bad boy is actually a bad girl. And she's quite easy on the eyes, too. I have a soft spot for girls covered in ink. Like Judy from Cyberpunk 2077, Nico from Devil May Cry 5, and of course Jack from Mass Effect. And a couple of the sirens that show up in Borderlands. Clara works as a tattoo artist, which, yeah, no shit, but that's just a front to cover for her work as a hacker and member of the hacking group DeadSect. DeadSect is a secret collective of hackers who oppose the CTOS system and are constantly hacking into it to cause trouble and expose its vulnerabilities, along with the questionable data gathering practices. Despite the game framing them as the good guy hackers who oppose the Evil Bloom Corporation, they don't really have much of an active role in the game's plot outside of a couple missions and side content. Circling back to Clara, after Aiden gets a bit too handsy with her, she reveals she wanted to meet face to face to let him know that she tracked a signal belonging to the guy who ordered the harassment of his sister. Clara then gives him access to dead sex hacking tech, which just unlocks the rest of your skill tree and lets you start putting points into the better perks. Clara also proposes a proper partnership, the two of them working together to get the people Aiden's after, though she doesn't really give a reason why. A pretty face with an air of mystery around her, just what are her motives and what is she really after? Before moving on, really quick, I want to read off Clara's character description from the Watchdogs website. Clara is seductive. She's dangerous. She's the trapdoor spider you never saw living right under you. She can weave her way through any system. And she can expose every secret you hide. Like, man, the game was really hyping her up to be this badass hacker. Like she'd be the trinity to Aiden's Neo. Someone dangerous and to be cautious of. But man, is that not really the case with her. Claire is definitely a talented hacker, and does a lot of the legwork when it comes to finding info for Aiden. But she's basically his sidekick, and plays the role of his voice on the radio as opposed to heading out to assist in person. I'm not saying she needed to be Trinity, but it feels like they could have done so much more with her character, especially since she's got a lot more going on than Aiden. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. We'll talk more about it later. Despite Clara having traced the signal, we still need a little more work to find the guy broadcasting it, as he's been bouncing it all over the city, specifically routing it through a CTOS office tower. Sneaking into the building, I kind of fumbled the stealth approach almost immediately, mainly since I wasn't used to my toolkit yet this early in the game. So I shot my way through some bloom guards to hack into their system, and after being sent to another location to follow the signal, Aiden finally comes face to face with that man who's been looking for him. Are you a clever boy? Perks are ready. Damien. Tell me you miss me. You had that punk call my sister. Why am I here, Damien? You're always so grim, Aiden. <laughs> like Aiden, that Botchmer lot job put a target on Damien's back too. In his case, he had his leg broken and he became disabled. I would say he got off easier than Aiden, but since he doesn't go into details about his disability, for all I know, he may be constantly suffering from pain due to his injury, which the bottle of booze he has with him sort of hints, as he might be abusing alcohol as a way to self-medicate and deal with the pain. Damien, like Aiden, is desperate to find out who went after them and get payback. But he needs his old partner's help, which is why he went after Nikki to flush him out. He reveals that there was another hacker in the system, and he has a way to track them down, proposing the two team up to find the guy. Aiden declines, insisting he doesn't need Damien's help, and he can find this guy on his own. 
Sure hope that decision doesn't blow up in his face later. After visiting Lena's grave, so the game can beat us over the head again that Aiden can't forgive himself for her death, and that Nikki wants him to stop his crusade to find the people responsible, we'll get a call from Jordy. One of the gangbangers from the stadium survived, and he could potentially ID Aiden if he decides to talk. Meeting up with Jordy in person, he goes on to explain it's a much bigger issue, as Aiden doesn't need to worry about the cops, but a different group who are looking to nab the survivor in order to interrogate him about what happened, potentially exposing Aiden to some old enemies. Sneaking through a rail yard with Jordy giving support with a sniper rifle, Aiden will interrogate the boss in charge and learn that a guy by the name of Angelo Tucci is going to lead a criminal convoy to prison in order to grab the survivor. Tracking down Angelo's niece, we hack her phone and trick her into calling her uncle and giving up his location. This whole set of missions effectively work as a tutorial for the criminal convoy side activity, where Aiden has to stop a target flanked by some guards from reaching their destination. For the most part, they're fairly simple, as the best approach is usually to get their attention, causing them to flee, and then hacking something in the environment, like traffic lights or steam pipes, in order to instantly disable their car. As the game goes on, they get even easier. As with your expanded arsenal and crafted items, you can usually kill the target without even bothering to chase them. With Angelo Tucci out of the way, all that's left to do is taking care of our snitch. And instead of paying someone to shank the guy in the shower, Eden's got a better idea. Freeze! Drop the gun! Now on the inside, Aiden will have to track down the potential snitch and put the fear of God in him so he doesn't expose him. The majority of this level is pure stealth, as while you have the option to knock out guards, if anyone spots their unconscious bodies, you'll blow your cover and instantly fail. Making use of cover and the cameras in the prison, Aiden will need to find out the name of the guy he's looking for, his current location, and finally reach the guy after he gets grabbed by some corrupt cops. Reaching their location, will engage them in a shootout and get introduced to a new enemy type, the Enforcer. Oh yeah, this game has enemy types. We got the standard gunmen who use weaker firearms and go down easy, veterans denoted with two chevron arrows who have stronger firepower but also go down easy, elites denoted with a star who have good firepower and armor that can soak up more bullets, and finally, Enforcers. Slow moving tanks decked out in military grade armor and weaponry. They soak up an insane amount of damage and can tank a few explosions before finally going down. And while technically not a separate enemy type, when profiling gunmen, some are able to call in reinforcements during a firefight. So you usually need to prioritize killing them first or disabling their communications. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in larger fights. Cool beans, now that all the guards are dead, how is Aiden going to scare this guy into making sure he doesn't squeal? Have we met? What? Have we met? Uh, no. No, I never seen you, man. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think so. So you're in here for 60 days. In good behavior, you're out in 30. <clears throat> what does that say? Sixty years? What are you doing, man? I'm just showing you an alternate future. You know, in case you get the urge to share your stories or make a deal with the cops. Wait, that's it? Threaten to hack the system and extend his sentence? I mean, anyone trying to get info out of him could probably do the same thing, right? Then again, Aiden did just bust into jail and kill a bunch of guards all so he could go see the guy face to face so it would be a little more intimidating than some random fixer. After escaping the prison and protecting Aiden's identity, we can now shift our focus to trying to find out who the second hacker was at the Merlot, which means talking to Damien again. Where are you? I don't think you're gonna like my answer. You know what? Forget it. I don't need whatever you got. 
Brought me nothing but trouble. We're done talking. Oh, too late, Aiden. <laughs> you won't believe where I am. Never mind, I'll send you the feed. Find a TV and have a look. That's Nikki's house. What are you doing? You should hurry, my boy. Your pretty sister needs you. Damien! Well, well, well. If it isn't the consequences of my actions. Guess Aiden shouldn't have been such a dick and just agreed to work with Damien in the first place. Which, when I think about it, I don't really think he has a good reason for not working with him. Yeah, Damien is a bit unhinged, and Aiden partially blames him for what happened at the Merlot. But the guy isn't all that different from Jordy in terms of morality, and Aiden works with him with no issues. Rushing back to Nikki's home, Damien has taken her hostage and moved her to an unknown location. Though he lets slip that he didn't grab Jackson. He promises to keep her safe and to give her back, but only after Aiden helps him track down the second hacker and the people who put a hit on them. Damien gives him a phone that will point to a hard drive that supposedly will lead them to the people they're after. While I did just say Aiden really should have just worked with them in the first place and avoided this outcome, Damien does seem to have ulterior motives outside of just finding out who went after them. His family once again in jeopardy because of his actions, Eden is forced to obey and work with his old mentor. First order of business though is to find Jackson before he's grabbed and used as more leverage against his uncle. Locating the kid by using the Find My iPhone app to track his tablet, turns out he's riding the train and is about to reach a stop. Since Damien is one step ahead of us and has his fixers en route to nab Jackson, Eden will buy himself some time by hacking the L train so it skips to the next stop. After taking out the fixers along the way, He'll reunite with Jackson, reassuring his nephew that everything will be okay, and asking if he overheard the men say anything when they nabbed his mom. I was a little confused with this scene because I had assumed Jackson just wasn't home when Damien's guys grabbed Nikki, but it sounds more like he ran away when it happened and hopped on the train to escape. Using his tablet, he'll write down a name he overheard, Racine. Calling up Jackson's therapist Yolanda, Eden asks if she can watch him for a few days Spinning a story about his sister's grief. Hey! Hello, sweetheart. What's going on, Mr. Pierce? Where's Nikki? Yeah, it's been a rough week. She's forced herself to get rid of Lena's stuff, and uh, I think she's finally saying her goodbyes. How bad is it? It's bad. She should call me. Well, she wanted me to call you. Oof. I don't know why, but something about this scene really bothers me. Like, I get he can't tell Yolanda his sister's been kidnapped, but making it sound like Nikki had a breakdown due to her grief feels really fucked up. Especially since it sounds like it's happened before during her therapy with Yolanda. With Jackson safe for now, we'll use the clue he gave us to start working towards saving his mother. Heading to a new area on the map, the industrial district known as the Brandon Docks, We'll get access to another CTOS control center and trace the name Racine to the Racine Boatyard. Someone who works there, or maybe even its owner, Robert Racine, possibly being involved with Damien and potentially leading us to where Nikki is held. Sneaking into the boatyard and making it to the owner's office, we'll hack his computer to find his location and overhear him speaking on the phone with Damien, confirming he snatched Nikki. Though apparently he wasn't supposed to go after Jackson, Damien warns Racine that he's pissed off Aiden even more and that he'll be coming for him. That same phone call also reveals that he doesn't know a thing about where Nikki was taken, which while it feels like we wasted our time chasing this lead, at least there's some catharsis and running him over and killing the guy when he tries to escape. Damien calls up afterwards to remind Aiden he needs to start playing ball and tracking the IP address he gave him if he ever wants his sister back. With no other options, we'll head back to the motel to scan the hard drive Damien gave us to look for any clues, and find that same video file the pair stumbled on during the Merlot job. The file is corrupted. All that can be made out is a scrambled image of some woman, but otherwise can't be played. Clara soon drops in, there to assist with tracking the mysterious IP address, but she starts acting strange and bails on helping when Eden reveals Damien gave it to him and that he kidnapped Nikki. Before we can get any answers from her, a group of fixers will attack the motel, as they're after the hard drive with the Merlot job data. Looks like Aiden got careless and exposed his location when he plugged the thing into his computer. After a very long sequence fighting our way out of the motel and getting Clara to safety, 
We'll get a call from Damien at the end of the mission and finally get to speak to Nikki. Confirming she's okay and billing her in that Jackson is safe, it's back to work trying to trace that IP address. But with Aiden's base of operations up in flames, which is his fault as he decided to blow up his motel room, we'll need to find a new place to work. One with better security that won't give away his location again. Luckily, Clara might know the perfect spot, as when meeting her later, she tells us about a place called the Bunker, which was the test site for the original CTOS, and that it's a convenient blind spot in the network that can keep everything Aiden does hidden. It's located on a small island across the river that can only be reached by bridge, as apparently Aiden can't just swim across or use a boat. Checking some nearby surveillance footage, they see an old man activate the bridge to cross over. Said old man is Tobias Frewer, one of the architects for the CTOS, before he was fired by Bloom and eventually went crazy. Now living near a homeless camp and running an underground shop where he sells tech to DedSec. After tracking down his location to a poker game in someone's basement, we'll chase him for a bit before Aiden catches up to him and convinces Tobias he can be trusted. The old man gives up the controller for the bridge and explains that the bunker will need power in order to access it. His shop will now be unlocked to purchase from, where you can buy completed hacks for a premium price as opposed to just crafting them yourself. While I kind of forgot about this place during most of my playthrough, it is pretty handy to get your hands on stronger hacks you haven't unlocked yet. Jordy will call up around this time and reveal that Maurice has finally started talking, explaining that Aiden needs to follow the trail he left behind to get his answers. This is referring to the burner phones he's left behind scattered around the game, the audio files on them filling in the blanks on his backstory and fleshing out Maurice's character. I'm going to wait before going into the details of the audio files, as they'll become much more relevant later. After crossing the magic bridge and powering on the generators around the island, we'll finally get access to this legendary bunker. With the place now online, Clara will track the mystery IP address to an apartment complex in Rossi, Fremont, a district under the control of the Viceroy's gang. Bizarrely, the place is completely off the grid, so Aiden will need to go there personally and put them back on the system if he wants to spy on them. It's basically an extended CTOS tower activation, as you'll have to sneak in, evade or kill any Viceroy's guarding the place, and then finally get to the tower to turn it on. As we're wandering around, we'll find recordings belonging to Iraq, the leader of the Viceroy's. Seems his gang have some kind of working relationship with the Chicago South Club, though Iraq is tired of playing second fiddle to Lucky Quinn, and is preparing to surpass the club as the de facto rulers of Chicago's underground. After turning on the tower and connecting Rossi Fremont back to the CTOS grid, we'll head back to the bunker to start spying on the place. But first, some playful banter between Clara and Aiden. You done then? You have what you need. So far, yeah. Okay, look, I, I, I understand if you're scared. I'm not scared. No one asked me to stay. Well, no one asked you to leave. You'll need to do better than that. <clears throat> I could use some help. I could use your help. Like a team? Sure, like a team. Not used to being a team. No, I'm not. Was that so hard? No. Let's go then. Sure. It's moments like this why I like Clara and wish the story had her do more. She actually gets this idiot plank of wood to a moat and humbles him from time to time. Getting to work, they infiltrate the Rossi Fremont housing complex and start snooping around the rundown and destitute building. The place is locked down like a fortress, with tons of viceroys on each floor acting as security to protect their criminal operations. Tracing the IP address to a room on the top floor, we're unable to peek inside as it's locked behind a card reader. 
Conveniently, we won't have to figure out how to get our hands on a key card. As a rack will step out of the room seconds later, the dog tags on his neck acting as the key to get inside. After watching him badger and threaten his cousin Bedbug over his failures, we overhear him talk to Lucky Quinn over the phone. The old man is pissed that Arak stole some guest list and threatens him that he'll end up dead if he keeps acting up and tries to screw him over. While initially brushing him off, Arak loses his cool at being talked down to and takes out his frustration on one of his goons by bashing his head in with a briefcase. With the building heavily guarded and several rooms locked behind heavy encryptions, Aiden formulates a plan to get inside by enlisting the help of the incompetent bedbug. Afterwards, Damien will call up for an update on how things are going, and after filling him in on where we trace the IP, he'll put Nikki on the phone again, who sounds way too chill about being kidnapped. What's going on? This guy talks like you two are friends. We're not friends. Not anymore. Nikki, just don't listen to his bullshit. Are you afraid he'll give up your secrets? I got no secrets. <laughs> Seriously, Aiden? You expect me to believe that? I'm your sister. Well, shouldn't my sister be cutting me a little slack? Really? Oh, because I'm being held by your friend and you need a little slack. Well, it sounds worse when you say it like that. <laughs> Aw, never hurt your feelings? I forget what a sensitive boy you are. Like, I get Damien is probably keeping her comfortable and isn't torturing her. Otherwise, Aiden would rain down hell on him. But you'd think she'd at least be angry with her brother, considering it's his fault she got dragged into this mess in the first place. Or, I don't know, maybe she's putting up a front to avoid worrying Aiden so he won't go off the rails. Heading to Bedbug's place, or his grandmother's place I should say, I'll spend way too much time trying to find an access point and hack the system to get a look inside. As we place a tracker on his phone, we'll overhear a conversation with his grandma where he explains how he got his nickname Bedbug. Bedbug doesn't even mean anything. Yeah, it does. It means I'm a player. Uh, a bed bug can get into any lady's bed. That's disgusting. No, I raised you better than that. Oh, and apparently bed bug is a reference to the character of Tyrone from Guy Ritchie's movie Snatch, as they both share a similar appearance and have the same first name. Still haven't gotten around to watching the movie, but maybe I'll finally bang it out during my break in January. Overhearing his phone call will covertly follow him as he meets with an associate of his named Rabbit, who has some important info. The guy reveals that Iraq wants Bedbug dead, that he's going to lead him to a remote location and have his men execute him. Instead of taking the warning seriously, he ends up getting angry instead and pulls out a gun, in denial his cousin would ever do that to him. Saving Rabbit by bursting a nearby steam pipe, Bedbug will declare him a snitch and sick all the local viceroys on him. We now have to get the guy to safety, this level acting as Watchdog's take on an escort mission. Using the security cameras, we'll guide Rabbit around the area, telling him when and where to move in order to avoid the Viceroys, making use of hackable things in the environment to create distractions or take out guards. Though you don't actually need to save him, because if he gets spotted or killed, he'll drop his phone and you'll need to personally retrieve it or hack it in order to learn the location of Bedbug's ambush. Stopping briefly to meet with Jordy and unlock IEDs as a new gadget to use, we'll head to where the ambush is set to take place, some abandoned factory. With some time to spare and with the help of some security footage, we could prepare for the hitman's arrival by setting booby traps around the factory. Again, this is that creativity I really like with this game. Not every encounter has to devolve into mindless shooting, and the right planning could make this encounter a lot easier. After springing my traps and picking off the survivors, we drop in on Bedbug and bring him into our little scheme with the help of some incriminating footage that show he's been stealing from Iraq. What you want? You're gonna be my eyes and ears inside Rossi Fremont. No! No, no, wait, man, Iraq will kill me! Yeah, what will he do when I send him everything I've got? You wanna see more? No! Just erase this shit, please! Well, you play along like a good little bug, and I will. I'll be in touch. Ah, uh, there's no better motivation than blackmail and the threat of death. With bedbugs serving as our eyes and ears inside of Rossi Fremont, we just need a way to get inside that locked room. Clara conveniently calls up, explaining that Iraq's dog tags have an RFID chip inside, 
and can be cloned if you get close enough to him. And the best way to do that is to attend an auction he'll be present at to meet with Lucky Quinn, the same auction referred to in the guest list that Arax stole. There's a lot of busy work here, so I'm just going to give the cliff notes. Clara helps track down the briefcase Arak had earlier. We trace it to a club-owned marina, copy the names on it, and decide to go undercover as a guest named Nicholas Crispin. To avoid bumping into the real guy at the auction, we hunt him down and kill him, then head to a sex club to pick up his invitation to the auction. Also, turns out Crispin has a thing for torturing women, as we inadvertently saved a girl named Poppy from his brutality. Though she's unable to escape the club as a tracking chip in the back of her neck makes it impossible to run. Promising to save her, Eden will request her presence at the auction, and finally we can go to where it's held and look for a rack. Oh, and the auction is being run by human traffickers who are selling kidnapped women to the highest bidders. Woof. While not extremely explicit, Watch Dogs doesn't pull any punches in showing just how grim and disgusting human trafficking is. The walk through the area incredibly uncomfortable as you see sobbing, half-naked women about to be sold. Learning many were kidnapped from overseas and had their identities erased. And as you walk around, you'll overhear all the things the buyers plan to do to them, or have already done to the girls they enslaved. Needless to say, it doesn't take much to motivate Aiden to want to tear down this entire operation. Bumping into a rack and copying his RFID chip, we'll then have an uncomfortable conversation with Lucky Quinn, who may have caught on that we're not who we claim to be. Experience has taught me Final not to be manipulated. Sold. Not to back down. Moving on to the next item on your tablets. I don't detect an accent, Mr. Christmas. Another bit received. Life has taught me a great many things to get me where I am. Bids are still open. And luck had nothing to do with any of it. Any other bids, gentlemen? <laughs> open to raise. Reuniting with Poppy. Aiden will scramble her tracking chip so she's free from the human traffickers. She warns him that Lucky and the club have caught on that Aiden isn't really Crispin, that he needs to get out of there fast. In a very, very long sequence, we'll escape outside and then shoot our way throughout the entire area until we finally make it to freedom. Oh, and if you're wondering what Aiden's plan was to stop the auction and save the girls inside, it's just calling the cops and reporting a shootout. Figuring that the police will stumble upon the auction, save the girls, and bust all the bidders inside. Which is a serious stretch in logic, Aiden. As for one, the girls could get caught in the crossfire, as the cops are responding to a reported shootout and might get a little overzealous. And two, there's corrupt cops working security and covering up the existence of the auction. Wouldn't they have planned for this exact thing to happen, and have a protocol to keep the honest cops away? Assuming there are honest cops and they didn't just send more guys on their payroll to squash the whole mess? The game does try to cover this flaw in his logic. As Aiden says, he'll hunt down any bidders who escaped and a new set of side missions will be unlocked. And god, they're so underwhelming. It's basically a new set of collectibles as you hunt down the bidders, hack their phones to find out where they live, and then scan the auction briefcases each one has to use as proof to expose them. Once you've found each briefcase, you unlock a final mission to take down the guy in charge of the whole operation, Joseph DeMarco, which is just another criminal convoy mission where you have to take out his car and stop him from escaping justice. You don't even get a cutscene with Aiden confronting the guy and condemning him for his crimes. Just some dialogue assuring us the trafficking ring will now be completely dismantled thanks to the mastermind being arrested. This is what I meant that some of the side content is underwhelming as a lot of it is just something to check off a completion list and not side quests that could tell an interesting story. Which sucks because the potential is there, they just don't follow through on it. Like did you guys know Watch Dogs has a serial killer running around? I had absolutely no clue until this playthrough. I was curious what this magnifying glass icon was on the map, so I went to check on one of them and stumbled on a murder scene, with the victim staged on top of what looks like a painted bear trap. The serial killer leaves some insane ramblings on a cell phone nearby talking about his crime. I was actually drawn in and excited about uncovering the mystery of who this guy was. Legit, I stopped playing the main story to go hunt down the other victims. With every crime scene I stumbled on and the more of his recordings I listened to, I was expecting to confront this unhinged guy in his murder house or something. Thinking it would be some kind of Saw-like encounter where I have to use stealth and hacking to get around his traps to reach him. 
all the while he's monologuing at me about his motives and how society made him a monster or some shit. Instead, once you found all his victims and discover his identity, the final mission to catch him is just a crappy crime prevention mission, where you stop him from killing his next victim and chase him around for a bit. Like seriously, all that build up and intrigue for such a limp dick of an ending. Red Dead Redemption 2 and the way it did its serial killer encounter was way better. I know I brought up earlier that the game incentivizes you to do side content with some skills being locked behind them, but giving you a reason to do something doesn't mean that it'll actually be fun to do. A good story with a solid payoff is a great way to redeem the most bare bones and underwhelming of fetch quests. I'd go on, but I know we're already like an hour into this video and still have more to go. And a lot of what I have to say has to do with the main story too, so I'll save it for later. Before we can make our move to find out what's in Iraq's secret room, we'll get a call from Yolanda. It turns out Jackson has taken off. Aiden thinks he's probably riding the trains to help deal with his anxiety, and insists he'll find him and not to involve the cops. Honestly, he sounds a little too sure of himself when he says that. Yeah, he tracks Jackson down like three seconds later by tracking his tablet again, but I feel like he should sound just a little bit more concerned. Though his attitude does a 180 when his nephew texts him that he's scared and trapped in some building with guys with guns wandering all over the place. Racing to Jackson's rescue, it turns out the kid stumbled into a safe house belonging to the Chicago South Club. Somehow. Also, this is one of those rare story missions where you have no choice but to kill every enemy there. Though, as a lazy and contrived way to justify this next scene. Let me get you someplace safe. Oh no, my nephew is afraid of me now because he saw me kill all those guys. What have I become? Am I no better than the criminals I've vowed to stop? Ugh. Look, I get this is an Ubisoft game, and they needed a way to force this scene to happen without worrying about the player doing a passive run this entire time. But why not have another moment like the earlier one with Clara, where some guy is holding Jackson and you're forced to headshot the guy to save him? Some blood lands on the kid, he freaks out at seeing the guy's brain splattered everywhere, and he could still have that same reaction of being scared of Aiden. Or do it in a cutscene or something. Yeah, I know, I'm being nitpicky, but it's hard to take the scene seriously when the drama is so forced. Also, despite worrying about what he's becoming, it doesn't really affect any of his choices later in the game. I'm pretty sure this whole moment isn't even brought up again. Alright, moving things along, it's time to find out what Iraq is hiding. With Bedbug in position, it's another escort mission as we guide him through Rossi Fremont to avoid being spotted by the Viceroys. After reaching Iraq's locked room, we discover he's been hiding a massive computer server here for some unknown purpose. As Aiden starts to download the data and we see that weird video again, Bedbug begins freaking out when he hears people coming, breaking the connection before all the data is downloaded. It's a rack, and he's not too happy to discover his cousin where he doesn't belong. Hey boy, what's this shit? Look, 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 it ain't what it looked like. What it looked like to you, because it looked like a super-sized fucking betrayal to me? How the fuck you even get in no, here? No, hold on! No. I love you, man. You know that. Uh -huh. Who bought you? Quit! No! Don't you wait, man! Don't you lie to me! No! Don't you fucking lie to my face! This is how you repay me for taking you in! Come on, cuz! I'm with family! You know it wasn't me! He, he, he made me do it! What the fuck? This is real close! No, 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 no! Stop it! Stop it! Get down there! Find that bitch! Well, shit, Aiden. Your actions in forcing Bedbug to be your man on the inside got the poor kid killed. Bedbug is a teenager, by the way. Apparently, he's only like 19 years old. I don't know that he's exactly clean and innocent, but he's obviously nowhere near as bad as Iraq or the rest of the Viceroys. Hey. Hey, is this thing still working? Bedbug, you're alive. You need to get out of there. I am out. I, I, I just thought maybe I could help you get your answers, you know, uh, about your family. Uh, that video we saw on the screen, Iraq asked me about it, uh, asked me what I knew about uh, Rose Washington. Rose Washington? I, I don't know who she is, but that's the girl in the video. Iraq says she's dead. Okay. Wait, how is Bedbug alive? Why is Bedbug alive? Iraq was going to have him executed for being incompetent, and then he got definitive proof with his own eyes 
that his cousin was betraying him. Why wouldn't he have tossed his ass out the window? For a moment, I thought maybe it was a trap by a rack, as the information Bedbug shares about the woman in the video being named Rose Washington, and the way he says it, sounds like a rack is directly feeding it to him, maybe as a way to double-cross Aiden or send him on a false lead. But Bedbug parts ways with Aiden and just vanishes from the plot, seemingly just running away before he actually does get killed. Okay, I'm sorry. I know I've probably been overly negative for a while now, but this is the game very obviously trying to absolve Aiden for any responsibility for his actions. Like he was actually feeling remorseful when shit hit the fan and he thought he got Bedbug killed. We were following up on the previous moment with Jackson, with Aiden questioning all he's doing and what he's becoming. Then all that goes out the window when Bedbug calls up and says he's good. The game really wants Aiden to be this anti-hero who makes morally questionable choices, but it's always finding some way to forgive his actions. It really feels like the writers were worried that he was starting to become unlikable with all the things he was doing. So they half-ass rewrote this scene for Bedbug to survive without accounting for how it makes no sense. Again, I'm going to hold off on saying even more, but I'm hoping most of you can understand why I'm having a hard time connecting with and liking Aiden. Speaking to Clara, she says that from the partial amount of data they were able to get from Iraq, it looks like he's been gathering info on just about every person in a position of power in Chicago, most likely planning to use all the dirt he has on them as leverage to force them to do whatever he wants and taking full control of the city. He also has information regarding the Merlot job, exactly what we need to give Damien and get Nikki freed. Eden wisely doesn't want to hand it over to his former mentor as he doesn't trust what he'll do with the info, but the heavy encryption on the files mean he and Clara won't know what they could be sitting on. They're going to need a different class of hacker to help them. One who towers above all others, and appears once every thousand years. The legendary super hacker, Raymond Kenny. It has to be him. He was a software engineer hired for the CTO startup. He created the encryption. The creator always has. While creaming her panties as she fangirls over her idol, Clara explains that Raymond Kenny was one of the creators of the CTOS system, most likely built the bunker, and has backdoor access to the system. If there's anyone who can decrypt their files, it's him. The only problem is that he's way off the grid, and hasn't been heard from in over a year. Of course, that's not going to stop us. Skimping over the finer details of this mission, we use the bunker to trace the spot where he was last online, then use that to trace his signal and narrow down his last known location to the charming rural town of Pawnee, bringing an end to Act 2 of the game. Okay, so I was getting a little too negative last act, so let's liven things up and talk about something I actually like a lot in this game. Pawnee and, by extension, Chicago as a whole. I've kind of neglected to talk about the map this whole time outside of what you can do here. As someone who's kind of grown tired of seeing different versions of LA and New York City constantly show up in video games, it's refreshing to see somewhere new. Now I've never been to the Windy City, and I know the game's version of it is much smaller and not a one-to-one -one replica, but I like it. You can see that Ubisoft put some care into designing their version of it, matching a lot of iconic buildings and landmarks with all the hotspots scattered around giving you some history on their locations. Though some things were changed for what I'm assuming is either copyright or licensing reasons, not quite sure what the rules are in recreating a real life building or art installation in a video game. So that big shiny bean goes to this weird jade donut looking thing for example. But still, it works. The various districts feel distinct and different from each other, from the high rise residential buildings and tourist attractions in the loop, to the bustling streets and fancy restaurants of the Mad Mile, all the bridges crossing over the Chicago River, how the city lights up at night, and how the entire game looks when it's raining. Which leads me to my favorite area, the small town of Pawnee. Maybe because I've spent my entire life growing up in the suburbs, and see myself as someone who enjoys visiting the city, not so much living there, but I've always been drawn to the simpler and quieter countryside, and Pawnee captures that vibe perfectly. With its large wilderness, its location right by the lake with a river running by it, the abandoned rail yard and train tracks, all the dirt paths scattered around and the tiny little town at the center, 
Also, I just love that the game is set during the fall. All the different colored trees really help the area pop and stand out. Side note, more open world games need changing seasons. It would go a long way to make a game feel more alive and vibrant as the scenery changes over time. The only open world game I can think of at the moment that does that and isn't explicitly a farming sim or something is Bully. Man, I love that game. Go watch that video, by the way. Despite the downgrade the game took in graphics, I think it still looks pretty good. And holy shit, I did not realize what a downgrade it was. Like, there's this Digital Foundry video comparing the E3 vid to what we got. And man, did things like the lighting and shadows take a massive nosedive. Along with the quality of the textures. Okay then, back to the plot in our search for Raymond Kenny. While we know he's in Pawnee, we need to do more signal tracking to narrow down where he is exactly. First tracing it to a computer in the marina, then to an old CTO West station, and after getting it up and running, we'll intercept an audio call that points us to Jedediah's bar. Alrighty, time to put on a friendly face and chat up the locals. Maybe this unassuming guy sitting in the corner might know something. Man, I'm only just now realizing that Aiden can't fight for shit. He has no melee moves and only relies on his baton for ambushes. If it wasn't for all his hacker bullshit, his tenure as a vigilante would have been very short. After Aiden comes to, our new pal T-Bone confirms that he and Raymond Kenny are one in the same. And I love this guy. Not only is he way more fun and likable in comparison to Aiden, but his goals and motives are a little more noble than just petty revenge. As I brought up earlier, he was one of the original creators of the CTOS, though he became increasingly disillusioned with Bloom as he realized just how dangerous the system could be, disgusted on how easily the company could invade people's privacy, collecting data on them, and more importantly, the huge vulnerability that comes with putting an entire infrastructure on just one system. After Raymond's warnings and concerns fell on deaf ears at Bloom, so much so they ultimately just decided to fire his ass, he did something drastic to try and prove his point and expose them, causing the Northeast Blackout of 2003, which was actually a real-life event that happened. Quick little history lesson for those who don't remember or know what it was, but it was a widespread power blackout that affected parts of the Northeastern and Midwest United States on August 12th of 2003. The issue started when tree branches came in contact with power lines in Ohio that would normally have caused a smaller local blackout, but it grew into a much bigger problem due to a software bug that failed to raise the alarm in the control room for the electrical company First Energy. Due to that, the operators were unaware that their transmission lines were becoming overloaded and didn't redistribute the power like they normally would, which led to the collapse of the Northeast Energy Distribution System. There's a lot more involved, and I'd suggest looking up some videos on YouTube discussing it further, but that's the cliff notes I gleaned from a few articles explaining it. Anyways, in this universe, Raymond Kenny was the one responsible for it, hoping that by taking down the system, he could expose the glaring problem with CTOS. Unfortunately, he ended up causing the deaths of 11 people due to the blackout, making him a wanted criminal and forcing him to go off the grid to avoid jail time and bloom. Now biding his time as a junkyard owner, building contraptions and art installations in his spare time. To his credit, he deeply regrets that his reckless actions led to their deaths, especially since his plan ultimately failed and CTOS continued to grow. Something that's explored a little more in the Bad Blood DLC, which I may or may not talk about towards the end of the video, especially since this is already pretty long. Going back to the present, Raymond, who prefers to be called T-Bone now, is justifiably apprehensive about Aiden managing to track him down, especially since it's very possible that he's completely exposed now and could easily be tracked down by Bloom, the cops, or other fixers. Aiden feeds him his sob story about Lena and how he needs T-Bone's epic hacking skills to decrypt the data, softening up the guy and agreeing to a deal. T-Bone will help him out but only after Aiden uploads some spyware into Bloom's corporate systems, which will give him access to the CTOS again. Also, he'll need to scrub T-Bone's biometrics from the system, 
Otherwise, he'll be instantly exposed to Bloom and the authorities the second he steps back into Chicago. Well, super. That shouldn't be too hard. After he shows us around his pad, T-Bone will send Aiden out to get back some Bloom tech that he stole and has in his truck, which was in turn stolen by the local Pawnee militia. After raiding their base and retrieving the coveted taco truck, the next order of business is to get the ID of a Bloom security chief. We'll start by following a Bloom helicopter to a trailer park that's being occupied by the militia. Hacking the helicopter to scan the area, we find two security chiefs, take their IDs, and get the hell out of there. Finally, after thinning some of Bloom's security by blowing up a convoy of more militiamen, we'll head off to infiltrate Bloom headquarters. After sneaking past all the security, Aiden will upload T-Bone's virus into the main system, wiping his biometrics and giving him backdoor access to the CTOS again. Before leaving, we overhear that our good pal Damien is here in the building. Huh, I don't know what that asshole is up to. It's betrayal. He's betraying us. Turns out Aiden was right. Damien did have ulterior motives this entire time. He just wanted to get his hands on the information Iraq was sitting on, so he could get full access to CTOS. Offering the CEO all the dirt on their company, the location of Raymond Kenny, and Aiden too. Which means T-Bone was 100% right that others were going to figure out where he was after we found him. Racing back to his junkyard, the militia has already descended on the place. So we'll need to clear out all these assholes and save them. And it's a pretty badass set piece. As we can control all of T-Bone's contraptions to kill the militiamen. Like his robot with Gatling guns. His fire breathing dragon. And his electric scorpion. The whole thing goes on for a while. With T-Bone helping us out as we carve a path towards freedom. The song Jesus Built My Hot Rod by Ministry playing towards the end of it, which may seem like it comes out of nowhere, but it's actually because T-Bone started blasting it as they were fighting. After blowing up his junkyard, he and Aiden will catch a boat and escape back to the bunker. After T-Bone meets Clara, he'll uphold his end of the bargain and get to work decrypting the data. That is right until Aiden does something extremely stupid. What happened? Well, Damien was there. What? How did he know? I don't know, he was working on a deal of his own. Something with Bloom. You never told me that. Hang on. No, hang on nothing. You better tell me what you're messed up in, all of it, or I ain't decrypting jack shit. Now, Damien and Bloom. You don't need to worry about that. I'll decide what I need to worry about, Aiden. You must... Seriously, Aiden, you were two feet behind the guy, and weren't even whispering. Did you not expect him to overhear you? Also, T-Bone is right. Pretty shitty that you didn't reveal what Damien was up to and how T-Bone's location ended up being exposed in the first place. Though he lets it go and forgives Aiden pretty fast, even though it was very obvious he was willing to sacrifice T-Bone, if it meant getting the name he wanted and continuing his revenge. Something he was guilt ridding about for like two seconds when he thought he got Bedbug killed before the plot saved the kid. No time for another rant about Aiden's character. Time to wrap up this act as while T-Bone and Clara get to work on cracking the encryption, we're going to need to get the rest of the data from Rossi Fremont. This time, we're taking the less subtle approach, with Aiden going to the fortress himself in order to get to Iraq's server room. First, with the help of Jordy, he'll fight off the guards patrolling outside, and once inside the building, Aiden will slowly make his way up each floor, massacring viceroys along the way. Finally reaching the server room, he'll download all the data and get his ass out of there. Huh. Where the hell is Iraq? Thought he would have had a trap waiting for us after that mess with Bedbug. Oh man, look at you. <laughs> Crispin? No, no, wait. Pierce, right? This all you, Pierce? The auction? Iraq! You the shit raining down on me? Cause I got a lot of shit raining down on me. <laughs> Stop right there. I'm not about to let you get away with this. You've been fucking me up, snooping in my shit, right? Interfering with my plans. Iraq, you're all dead! It was you. You were the other hacker in the Merlot. That there's my currency. My masterpiece. And you're trying to take that from me. You took something far more valuable from me. I took from you. Motherfucker, I don't even know you. Huh. I kind of figured Iraq just had some fixer working for him stealing all the data. Wasn't expecting him to be the one doing all the work. 
though considering the discretion needed in his plan of stealing the data to blackmail all of Chicago with, it does make sense he'd do the work so no one would expose him. Cue a very obnoxious boss encounter with Iraq. First, he just goes on a rant for a full minute while I'm wandering in circles waiting for something to happen. Honestly, for a second, I thought the encounter broke and I was supposed to be running through a door or something. It wasn't until his guy spawned literally out of nowhere that I realized that yes, I did have to wait for his stupid speech to be over. And if you die here, you have to sit through it again when reloading from the checkpoint. The first phase of this fight isn't too bad. There's a decent amount of cover and things you can use to pick off his men. It's the second phase that's a little more annoying, as Arak sends out his enforcer bodyguard, who I swear must have three times the help of the normal one, as I must have hit him with at least five explosions and he still wouldn't go down. Also, I thought the guy was Arak at first, and didn't realize it wasn't until the lights went out and Arak popped up to help out his bodyguard. Iraq was protecting a tinderbox of blackmail. But he was after something bigger. He wanted the video from the Merlot job. He never did find it. Well, the Viceroys are gonna regroup, and a new leader will step up. And Bedbug? He's got a chance to get out now. I hope he takes that chance. Yeah, really Aiden, now you care about Bedbug's well-being? Now that we have everything we need, we can finally decrypt the data, give it to Damien, and save Nikki. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, what's this? Is this off the server? Oh, hell! Somebody's trying to hack in! We'll lose everything! Shut him out! Now! What do we do? Follow that signal back. If we can find the source, we can kill his action. Hurry! Who is it, Clara? He seems to know you. She's the person you know. I don't know. May I play? <laughs> Why not too difficult to find them? Two men. One's a hacker, the other a fixer, as far as I could tell. I've heard of them before. I can't explain. I, I wanted to tell you. Nice work. Names, please. Remember when I said Clara had more going on with her character? Turns out she was the one responsible for tracking down and exposing Aiden and Damien. This is why she offered to team up with Aiden in the first place. It was her way of making amends as she felt guilty and responsible for Lena getting killed. This is also why Clara freaked out when she found out about Damien kidnapping Nikki as another person was getting caught in the crossfire because of what she did. Also, in a blink and you'll miss it moment, the game actually gives away what she did, as the cutscene that plays after the Merlot job shows an email being sent with Aiden and Damien's names on it, sent from a bad boy 17. Angry, Aiden grills Clara about who hired her, but she doesn't know, and swears she would have told him if she did. That's not good enough for Aiden, who, still angry and betrayed, sends her on her way. Our troubles are far from over though, as the fixer who hacked the bunker, Default, has successfully stolen all the data we gathered and deleted it from the bunker servers. T-Bone will get to work rebooting the backup tower so they can track down the cocky bastard. In the meantime, Aiden will have to meet with Damien and stall for time till they can get the data back. Meeting up, Damien was smart enough not to bring Nikki with him since he already figured Aiden wouldn't bring the data, though he is nice enough to let him speak to his sister again. Growing fed up with how long his old partner is taking getting him what he wants, Damien takes off the kid gloves and doxes Aiden, broadcasting his name and face all over the city and exposing him as the vigilante. While we manage to stop the camera van broadcasting his face all over Chicago, the damage is already done and the cops will swarm in on his location. After a long sequence of aiding the cops, we'll finally give them the slip as they call off their search for now. Well, today has been one shitty day, hasn't it? There is one silver lining though, as when speaking to Nikki, Aiden overheard a PA system saying something in the background. Sending the audio recording to T-Bone, he may be able to isolate the sounds and figure out where she's being held. It's going to take some time though, so for now we'll need to track down Default and get our data back from him. After raiding the hacker's safe house, we don't find him, but T-Bone managed to learn that the kid regularly hangs out at a place called Dot Connection. 
Heading to the tech team nightclub, we get into a game of cat and mouse with Default, scanning everyone around him and doing slightly harder hacker puzzles until we find the kid. Huh, a mouse themed DJ. Why does that sound familiar? Chasing after him, we'll fight through a small army of his fixer friends and follow him around Chicago, while simultaneously stealing back the data he took. With it back where it belongs, T-Bone also managed to isolate the audio file from the last call with Nikki, and we finally know where she is. Heading to her location, we can't step inside without risking her safety, so instead it's another escort mission to guide her out of there. Nikki, it's me. Aiden! Where are you? There's men everywhere. The, the guard here, he just... I don't know what happened. Listen, I know. I'm getting you out. I'm gonna stay on the phone, and I'm gonna walk you out. No! They'll find me. Nikki, there's a gun there. I want you to pick it up. Just in case. Oh, God. This is crazy. Aiden, I don't know guns. <laughs> I shot him. We gotta move. Listen to my voice. I think I killed him. Nikki, listen to me. We're gonna move now. I'm gonna guide you every step. You know, this escort mission is nothing special, but I love how real Nikki's reaction is after shooting that guy. She's never shot anyone before. Just rabbits on a hunting trip. Never killed anyone before. Nikki didn't shoot in self-defense or even get ordered by her brother to do it. She just panicked when that guy burst into the room. And she's having a serious breakdown while we're guiding her through the warehouse. She's terrified she did kill that guy. Says he brought her blankets the night before and thinks she should go back and help him. Nikki can't grasp taking a life and questions how Aiden can do it so easily. It's a great little segment and really goes to show just how disconnected Aiden is from all the things he does. I'd chastise him for not comforting his sister but admittedly this isn't the time or the place, and getting her out does take priority. And to Aiden's credit, he does feel guilty that he put his sister in a position where she ended up killing someone. Due to that, and because Aiden has been publicly exposed as the vigilante now, something Nikki learns when she returns home, he has no choice but to cut ties with his family and send them into hiding. Didn't have to be this way, but what other options do we have? Are we okay? Remember when we were kids? And I would... follow you? And you'd try and get away from me, and... stupid me, I kept trying. I didn't like your cars, or... hockey. And your friends were gross. Yeah. I followed you because I idolized you. Like Jackson does. And I kept hoping that you walked me around, but... Eventually, I just hoped that you would look back. All I can say is I'm sorry. I'm not following you anymore. I know. <laughs> Once again, Eden's antics have cost him his family, and if you think we're going to get a moment where he breaks down and realizes he's lost everything, you're in for some disappointment. T-Bone will call right after, having found an audio file on all the data they had and learning who it was that put the hit on Aiden. It was Lucky Quinn, which, when I think about it, seemed pretty obvious, as he owns the Merlot. Also, he's like the big evil for most of the game. Heading back to where this all began, Clara will call up and apologize about what happened, ominously promising that she's going to fix things before hanging up. Sneaking into the Merlot, we see Mayor Donovan Rushmore giving a speech to a group of people before he leaves to speak with Lucky Quinn in private. Looks like the old man has been manipulating the mayor for some time now and has some really spicy info on him. Sneaking through the hotel, 
Aiden will eventually reach Lucky Quinn. And after the old man does his haha, I'm evil routine, after he hears Aiden's motivations was to avenge a little girl, it's blasting time. Aiden will fight a combination of goons from the Chicago South Club and the Chicago Police Department, slowly making his way to Lucky Quinn's location. On the way, the game will beat us over the head constantly and tell us through audio files and emails scattered about that Clara has cut ties with the Chicago South Club and now has a bounty on her head. Cornering Lucky Quinn in his panic room, he gloats for a bit about how he can't get to him, forgetting that his pacemaker is hackable. As his heart slowly starts to give out, we'll finally find out what's on the elusive video that started this entire mess. It's hidden footage of the mayor accidentally murdering Rose Washington. You expect me to bake? Lucky Quinn? On his knees. Beg all you want, that doesn't interest me. You don't even know why we attacked you. It was a mistake. We thought you wanted this. Don't lie to me, Rose. You were just sloppy. I, if you'd I walked away. I would have forgotten you. What a lovely woman, Rose Washington. Wasn't for her death, where would I be? <laughs> Most women die without purpose. But she had enough sense to die in front of the camera. <laughs> See, and our mayor never tidy with his secrets. And stupid enough to fall in love. Lucky Quinn was using that footage as leverage to manipulate the mayor, forcing him to be his puppet and do his bidding. It's why he put out the hits on Aiden and Damien. He couldn't risk that video getting leaked or sold to someone like Iraq, or he'd lose all his power. If I'm being honest, I'm kind of whatever with this reveal. I was never really all that invested with what was on the video, mainly because the game focuses more on Aiden's revenge quest than the mystery of the video. Oh well, let's send this asshole to hell. Quinn's dead. This is the part where I'm supposed to say I feel empty, right? I'd be lying to myself. I finally feel awake. Like I can breathe again. And Lena? Nothing can change her death. But maybe I can still do something that'll make a difference. So this is going to sound hypocritical because of how much I criticized Aiden the entire game. But I actually love this line from him. If I'm being honest, I feel like revenge stories have become increasingly stale. They used to be these power fantasies where the hero goes on a warpath to kill the villain and avenge those he lost. Now it's the opposite extreme. Constantly preaching about the consequences of chasing revenge. Most stories hammering that point over and over again with the subtlety of taking a golf club to the head. Eden's story is weirdly a mix of both. He did lose everything, but he's still living the power fantasy and doesn't realize he has nothing now. Mind you, there's no way that was intentional. This is Ubisoft after all. The game's writing was constantly tripping over itself to both shame and excuse Eden's actions throughout the game. It couldn't decide what story it wanted to tell, and so we ended up with a selfish and unlikable protagonist who remains static throughout the game. After escaping the Merlot, Damien calls up to grill Aiden about Clara's involvement and what happened to them. Apparently, she tried to trade herself for Nikki's safety, revealing to him she was the one who gave their names to Quinn. Bitter and with nothing left to lose now, Damien has given away Clara's location to the Chicago South Club, so we need to race to save her. I should point out he doesn't explicitly say that. It's more like something I gleaned from the conversation, as at first it sounds like Damien is sending his own guys after her. But all the audio logs and emails in the Merlot already established that the club is after her. And on the way to her location, Tebow calls up and specifically warns Aiden its club car is heading his way. So yeah, those lines of dialogue are just phrased really weird. Making it to the cemetery, we're unfortunately too late. Ah! 
After killing all the hitmen, we'll play an audio recording that Clara left for Aiden. She explains how she first saw Aiden when he was playing chess with Jackson in the park, how she noticed how much pain he and his family was in after Lena's death. Blaming herself, Clara thought she could ease his pain by helping him and possibly even overcome her own pain and guilt for the role she played. It's such a sad end for Clara, mainly because it feels like Aiden should be the one on the ground full of holes. He should be the one reaping the consequences of everything that happened, not her. She actually had noble intentions of trying to make up for her mistake by trying to help the people she hurt. Meanwhile, Aiden was a selfish asshole who made things worse and worse for the people he was supposed to protect. Poor Clara. She really deserved better. With Aiden's thirst for revenge now quenched, there's only one loose end to tie up. Damien Brinks. Remember way back towards like the middle of the video? When I brought up how Aiden didn't trust Damien because he had ulterior motives outside of finding out who called the hit on them? At first, we're led to believe it's full access to the CTOS system, but it turns out it's something completely different. A highly sophisticated behavioral prediction software called Bellwether. Using all the data collected through the CTOS system, it can make logically precise predictions about things like stocks, the mayor getting reelected, or crimes before they even happen. Not only that, it can also be used to manipulate exact outcomes someone would want through the use of profiling, media manipulation, and all sorts of other factors. Using Bellwether, Bloom and Lucky Quinn were able to get the mayor re-elected and then create the circumstances where he killed Rose Washington and gave them blackmail to control him. Anyways, Damien wants it. Sorry if I'm not commenting on it further. Predictive algorithms are a very real thing. You see it used in stocks, when it comes to recommending what ads you see on websites, and it's used here on YouTube to recommend user videos and creators you might like. That's how you found my channel. Thanks, predictive algorithms. There's a very real discussion to be had about how our lives are run by algorithms and how data can be used to manipulate and control people. But the game introduces this idea way, way too late. It doesn't take enough time to explore the concept and what effects it can have on the world. It's just set up as a MacGuffin that we can't let the villain have. Watch Dog's cyberpunk dystopia and the idea that technology is consuming all aspects of our lives is just window dressing for its stupid revenge plot. And man, it is such a waste. All right, let's wrap things up. Aiden decides to leak all the info they got from Iraq, exposing the mayor for killing Rose Washington and exposing a whole bunch of other corruption. Damien calls up all pissy, ready to settle the score once and for all. Also, he's managed to unlock CTOS and has complete control of the system now. Somehow. I don't know, maybe he bamboozled the Bloom CEO when he was in their HQ. The game doesn't explain how he managed to do it. This section is considerably harder because of his access though. As while Aiden is running around the map trying to triangulate his location, Damien is attempting to slow him down by using all the environmental hacks against him, all the while preventing Aiden from using them himself, which makes the police considerably more annoying to evade, as you can only use your crafted hacks or sheer firepower to get rid of them. Since Damien is too powerful now, we need to find a way to turn off the system and lock him out of it long enough to stop him. Aiden suggests he and T-Bone cause another blackout, something our buddy is extremely reluctant to do considering the people he killed the last time he did that. Unfortunately for T-Bone, he's not the protagonist, so he's forced into going along with Aiden's extremely reckless idea. He'll cook up a virus to upload into the CTOS, allowing them to lock out Damien's control long enough for them to take control of a satellite running the entire system. On the way to the access point, DeadSec decides to finally participate in the plot, asking Aiden to let them drop their code into the system so they can take control of CTOS away from Bloom. They also name drop the game's title. We will be the watchdogs. No, I'm tired of all the noise. Aiden says no, of course. Not because he can't trust DeadSec to not abuse that power the same way Bloom did, but because this is his city, and he'll protect it. Or that's the vibe I get anyhow. Dead sect are so painfully underdeveloped, you can't really make a judgment about whether their mission to oppose Bloom is genuine or not. And Aiden sounds way more concerned about the public finding out he gave them access, as opposed to what would happen if he did give them control. Hacking into the CTOS satellite, Aiden successfully disables the system and causes a city-wide blackout. No time to worry about the potential repercussions of such a reckless and dangerous move. We gotta take down our former mentor. Tracing Damien's call to a lighthouse off the shore, the old partners will come face to face for one final showdown. 
Come on. Surprise, surprise. You got a speech, Damien? Anything you want to say? I know who I am now. That's it? That's all you got? Hey, fuck you! Look at you! You plowed over people to get to a mob boss. Damien basically parrots everything I've been saying about Aiden. How everything that happened with Lena, Clara, and his family leaving were direct consequences of his actions. Which falls on deaf ears, of course. Then Jordy shows up and betrays us out of nowhere. Oh, oh, Jesus, you guys talk a lot. What are you doing here? Sorry, pal. New contract. Kick it over. What? Come on, kick it over. You know, you guys take things far too personally. That's your problem. That's why this went wrong. There's lessons to be learned here, fellas. Up, 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 phone two. Give it to me. Come on, hand it over. I don't know what Damien wanted in those final moments. Death, I suppose. I thought I could fix the little girl's death, but instead it led to all of this. Exposed lies, corrupted kings, a broken city. And me, changed man. I don't look back anymore. I don't regret. Look forward. Everything is connected. And I'll use that to expose, to protect, and if necessary, to punish. I am vengeance. I am the night. I am Batman! And that was Watch Dogs. Christ, what a wet fart of an ending. Aiden learns absolutely nothing throughout this story, decides to ignore his role in this mess, and accepts no responsibility for his actions, instead deciding to become Chicago's version of Batman. Jordy's betrayal is set up somewhat at least, as during an earlier mission he did warn Aiden that there's a considerably high bounty on his head, and that tons of fixers would be after him, and the game already established that these two aren't friends and Jordy's all about the money. But his betrayal means Jack's ship because he'll call up during the closing credits to tell Aiden where he can find Maurice. And the two of them treat the whole event like they got into an argument or something. Oh, and that finally brings me to Maurice. The game will now give you the choice in sparing or killing him. By collecting his burner phones throughout the game, we learn he was way over his head when he started working for the Chicago South Club, completely thrown off by their sadism and brutality. After taking the hit job on Aiden, He's been overwhelmed with guilt for inadvertently killing Lena when he caused their car to crash. Since he failed to kill Aiden, the club decided to punish him by kidnapping and selling his wife off to human traffickers, leaving Maurice alive so he can live in his own misery. This choice and whether he lives or dies is so empty. The game's over already, who cares? Like it really wants to frame it as Aiden learning to forgive Maurice and doing the right thing by giving him a second chance by letting him live? But it was established way back at the beginning of the game that Aiden was only after the person who gave the orders, and Maurice was just a means to that end. And he avenged Lena when he killed Lucky Quinn. So letting him live isn't a mercy that shows Aiden's character has grown, just that he doesn't need the guy anymore. I was going to use this section to talk about the DLC, but unfortunately I didn't finish it in time for this video. So what did I think of the game? Well, my opinion has moved from it being an average and forgettable game to it being a deeply flawed, but still fun game. But yeah, still kind of average. I really enjoyed the gameplay. Its combat was fun. The hacking mechanics gives you a decent amount of tools where you can get creative with encounters and avoid repetition. It has some decent side characters like Clara and T-Bone, who have deeper motives outside of revenge. I like driving around Chicago. Its take on police AI and chases is solid. And the progression tree doesn't feel tacked on or pointless. 
but its open world and side content are your standard Ubisoft affair. Just dumb things to check off a completion list with no real substance. And the thing that really drags down the game is its writing. It presents ideas about how people are constantly being monitored, how easily accessible your personal data is, the dangers of everything being online, and how tech corporations can use algorithms to manipulate people. And it doesn't do anything to explore those ideas. Instead, they just go by the wayside so we can focus on the most generic of revenge plots. I've said it several times already, but Aiden is a shitty protagonist. He's all the worst aspects of an unlikable protag or anti-hero. But usually those character types are given something to make the audience sympathize with them. But not Aiden. He's just a self-centered charisma vacuum, who only cares about what he wants and constantly shifts the blame for the things he's done. He doesn't have a character arc. He ends the game exactly as he started it. A selfish asshole who thinks he's doing good and saving the world. The crazy thing is that the game does try to point out his flaws. Just about everyone he interacts with calls him out on it, but he never changes. It's not until the DLC for Watch Dogs Legion that we finally see him suffer the consequences of his choices, which is probably why those who played it enjoyed it so much. I don't think Watch Dogs is a bad game. Like I said, I did have fun for the most part, but there is just a lot of wasted potential here. I haven't played the sequels and I'm aware both have their own issues, but I'm interested in finding out what mistakes they fixed and learned from that were in this game. Did the writing get better? Was the hacking expanded on? Is the open world more interesting to explore? Who knows, maybe I'll take a crack at them and find out for myself one day. No outro this time around, so thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time for Sleeping Dogs. I've been recording it while working on this video too, so most likely it's going to drop between Christmas and New Year's. So till then, Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, and Happy Holidays. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.